missed it. Scott Hanselman's our presenter tonight. <laughs> he has a sniffle, so quiet. That's are killing me, man. All right. Hang on. That's probably not going to work. All right, well, lower your expectations. <laughs> pop, pop, pop. Cool. Whoever's got the mic. Is that loud enough? Is that good? Because I'm not going to yell. All right, cool. Um, yeah, forgive me. I have the sniffles. I was in either the Balkans or the Baltics. I can't remember which ones they are. Latvia, Estonia, Baltics. How do you know? How do you keep track? Potato, potato. You just, you just yelled it out with confidence, but then you couldn't back it up. <laughs> what is the difference? Baltics are Scandinavia. Okay, Estonia is Scandinavian. Yeah. On the Baltic, the Baltic, sea. Sea, Baltic Sea, that's good. What's the Balkans? Balkans are like Croatia down there. No, I wasn't there. I was in Czechoslovakia, now Czechia. Is that the Balkans? Close? It's close to the Balkans. Okay, I was in those places last, last week. Um, and I, was, I, was, I, went, I did 11 talks in four cities in six days. And then I came and, and I pureled everything. I pureled the bed. I pureled the seat. I was just squirting the purel everywhere. And I made through the entire experience without getting sick at all. It's amazing. And then I come home. I hugged my 11-year-old, and he coughed directly into my mouth. <laughs> so, so now I'm sniffling, and that's, uh, so I got that going for me. And then uh, I may have sneezing fits that may last for hours. And I got to figure out which of these many things to mute in order to do that. I'm dying. Um, and then uh, I forgot that I had Taekwondo today. Uh, so if you need any old men or small children beaten up, I can take care of that for you. <laughs> um, I'm a kind of a slow moving Taekwondo type person. Um, and I came directly from Taekwondo here. Uh, and I didn't think I'd have enough time. But then I forgot Rich was doing the intro. <laughs> <laughs> so I could have come, could have come tomorrow night. All right. <laughs> Is he still here? <laughs> All right, cool. So I have no slides and no plan and nothing to say. Um, but I thought it would be cool to talk about uh, WSL and WSL2. And um, you're nodding your head, which always makes me happy. Um, that means you want to hear that, right? Or your neck is. Um, and then I was going to talk about the Windows terminal and some of the improvements that's been going on around the console. I'm hearing that, okay. Are there any people who are now sitting in this room saying, I've never heard of the Windows terminal, I don't know what WSL is? It's okay. Good, that's good. So then we're introducing new concepts and stuff like that. Are there any young people who were drugged, there, drugged here by their parents? <laughs> yeah? And do you have like, you haven't got an iPad or anything, right? You have nothing to entertain yourself with? <laughs> no, you came for the tech? Yeah, and already you're disappointed. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. So we have one young person, right? Another young person over there? You, you're, you're youngish. Got the baseball cap backwards. I could, that was a tell. You're young. Another, oh, oh, my goodness. Now I have to entertain like eight-year-olds now. What am I going to do? But don't worry. I don't work blue, so we won't have any swear words or anything. But I do have a very scratchy, scratchy Kleenex, though. So there'll be some of that. Okay. How can we explain this to you? Now I'm like paralyzed because I was like, how am I going to explain this to middle-aged programmers and now plus five teens? How do I explain this? All right. Teenagers. We'll just talk to the kids. This is Windows. Um, I, know where, I know where everything is. Does your, does your desktop look like this? You know where your things are? Do you have so many things that they've actually stacked up and there's like nine... <laughs> There's like nine things there. Have you, have you figured that out? No? I know where it all is, so it's OK. I'm just going to erase that. It'll be fine. OK, this is my Windows. I know where everything is. It's great. You should put things on your desktop, because that's what it's for. 
um, young people, have you ever gone out to this thing and typed this, and then you're like at an all-black screen? You ever do that, young people? Yes. Yeah? And then what do you do at that point? You just reboot? <laughs> <laughs> you're like, I don't know how I got here. Okay. This is called DOS. But it's not really DOS. It's a, it's a lie. There is a thing. Back in the day, your computer would start up and look like this. And um, there's a really great website. Let's hope it's still there because sometimes you think that there's a, a website and then you find that that's been taken over by like a Chinese company or whatever. This is how computers used to start up. You go out to the command line and you type a thing and it would go like that. Remember this? And then you type, you, like, you're like, what do I do? And you type win because you're winning. And then Windows would start, go ba-ba. And that would happen from negative 20 to negative 30 years ago. And it would make all kinds of cool sounds <laughs> like that. And it, it was just a, it was like, oh, computers have sound. That's all that was for. It was just to remind you that computers had sound. And it would start up like this, and it would count your memory. And we didn't have a lot of memory back then, so it didn't take long to count it. <laughs> And, and you would go out to the command line, and then you'd have to like type change directory. And then you'd have a C drive. And uh, many, many years ago, there was an A and a B drive, but we don't know where they are anymore. <laughs> There's an A drive and a B drive. And now when you say, hey, mommy, why is there a C drive? Just, we don't know, because it's just always, it's always been there. It's called, it's called C, because A and B are gone. Um, if I go to A, it's like, I can't find it. I don't know where that drive is. It's dead. And you have to go around, and you can type CD, and then if you type U and you hit tab, it auto-completes. So then I can type like this, which is really cool. All right, and then I can go on like that, and now I'm on the desktop. And it's not really fun, but if I go to the top part and go DIR, and I say slash S for subdirectory, that means all of it. So that's, oh, that doesn't look healthy. What the hell was that? What the heck was that? Oh my God, what's happening here? That's not a, what is this? <laughs> Apparently something bad happened in May of 2008 on my computer, and I have never seen it before. I'm going to go and mentally think about fixing that later. So when I go and say dir slash s, it goes, and it starts spitting stuff out. So at the command line, it's painting. So the computer says, hey, I want to paint some text, and it paints out this text. And here's a dirty little secret about Windows. The smaller this window is, the faster it goes. <laughs> if you go like this, it would be like really slow. So the problem is that the thing that paints the black text, the black screen, and then puts the text there. The thing that does that painting is called the console. And the thing that is asking me to type my, my uh, inputs there is called the shell. And most people, no matter how old they are, don't understand that a shell is not a terminal. A shell is not a console. They're separate things. But y'all, and y'all are the set of all people who aren't me, uh, Y'all tend to conflate that stuff. Conflate means to smush together. So the thing that is the console is this. It's the, it painted that. It painted the, this. It painted that. It painted all this. And it's in charge of drawing all of that. And if I go and type in PowerShell, that's a, that's a, 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 a shell. And if I type in Bash, that's a shell. And if I type in Ubuntu, that's a shell. And they all look different. But the outer bit, the pro oops, the outer bit is paint is, is handled by the same exact application. So Windows has this ability to have a console and pay, print out text. And it's horrible because Windows 10 is brand new and you know it's always getting updated and it's wonderful, but the console hasn't changed in 30 years, which sucks. Now remember when I said I did a directory there and it was spewing out text and I said that the less that it paints, the faster it gets. It actually is worse than that. What you're doing is actually being blocked by the painting. 
So that means that the fastest thing you could possibly do if you had like a program that was spitting out a lot of text is to minimize it. Now it's going like super fast because it doesn't have to paint anything. So you can actually, if you're doing like a build at work and it's super slow and you're like, why is this slow? Minimize it. It will be like 30% faster. Yeah, totally sucks, right? You like, you're like, you laugh, but you're like, Bleh. right? It's just like learning a weird thing about a car. Like this car goes better in second gear. Like it shouldn't, but it does. And now you know that about the car. It's got a quirk. This is a quirk of Windows. In fact, also, this is, oh, you know what this is? This is from my game Baby Smash. You're all like wondering what's going on here, right? But you didn't want to say anything. Uh, I wrote a video game called Baby Smash. You can go to, it's not for smashing babies. It's for, <laughs> it's for babies to smash the keyboard. And that's a good thing for you to check out. You can like take this game and download it and like modify it. And then babies push the keyboard and it goes, hello, and, make la and, it, and it plays these things and it like puts out text and stuff. It's fun. I wrote it for my baby uh, who is now 14. Um, and uh, I was actually watching a, um, a Lifetime original film uh, and I had nothing else to do. Uh, my wife wasn't paying attention, so I wrote this game. And you can go and you can get that game at babysmash.com. Is that me? Is that in my head? No? Okay, cool. I thought I was having a stroke there for just a second. And you, you push buttons and it goes and it sings and it's dance. It's Baby Smash. It's great. Okay. So the thing that paints this box, some of you have seen this box before. Some of you remember when this box didn't have any fonts to pick from. That is called con host, the console host. So to be clear, shells are a thing, and the console is a thing, and they are separate things. Savvy? So name some shells. PowerShell, Bash, Z shell, Z -shell. Corn shell. Pulling that out of 1986. <laughs> nice. Fish. No one said fish. Fish shell is good. These are all different shells, right? It's just like TV channels. You pick the one that makes you happy. Some are more popular than others. Uh, someone might say that theirs is super popular. It doesn't matter. You use the one that makes you happy. The thing that is the shell is separate from the terminal. Now, there's lots of different programs. You can go and download other people's terminals. So, like, here's an app called Fluent Terminal. It's like super pretty and it's got like a cool background. You can like see the little transparent like deal going on here. That's this is called um, Terminus. This is kind of a cool looking. These are all different perspectives on what a terminal should look like. Make sense? All right. Unfortunately, though, those third party terminals do this weird thing. They will actually create one of these. They will create that black box. You'll see a flash and then it'll hide it. And then they'll say, no, no, I will do the painting. And then they will minimize it. So they'll go like this. Bloop. But they're actually scraping the text off of it and painting it. So it's a hack. You might ask yourself, why is it a hack? It's a hack because Windows did not make it easy for them to talk to this thing. And they're literally screen scraping this stuff, which sucks. So not only does this suck, it sucks like multiple levels. It sucks architecturally. It sucks so bad that people were willing to hack around it and do other stuff. Now, if I go looking for... Uh, this is called Process Explorer. It's like Task Manager, but it doesn't suck. Um, <laughs> and Process Explorer you can download for free, and it's a way of like looking at what's going on inside of your computer. It's like debug mode for your Xbox. Like, what's happening inside? So I'm going to scroll around, blah, blah, blah. Like, I can see all of these copies of Edge. It's not Edge's fault. It's because it's Chrome. Um, it's, it's funny because it's true, kids. It is. Uh, uh, uh. Where is PowerShell? Here we go. Look, look, look. Look at that. Look at that. So here's three shells, okay? And there's three con hosts.
and you have never seen Conhost before, none of you have ever run it before, and you may have been in software for the last 20 years and you may have never even heard of the thing because it's been quietly painting that square and dealing with text for all of these years. Good news, there's a new one. Bad news, we can't get rid of the old one. <laughs> Why can't we get rid of the old one? Because it's part of the operating system. Well, we can change the operating system because we do work for Microsoft. But you said legacy behavior. Legacy behavior. What does legacy behavior mean to an eight-year-old? Uh, you gotta keep it running as it has it the whole time. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> and when you do fix it, don't break it. So, does Apple believe in that? No. I've got a Mac Mini, and I woke up one lovely Tuesday morning, and Apple said, <laughs> you don't get that update. And my Mac Mini has been stuck on Snow Leopard for the last 15 years because they just decided one day you can't do that. But you can run applications from 1977 on Windows 10 today. You can run VisiCalc, the first spreadsheet on a Windows 10 machine. Now, I'm not saying that because I'm a Microsoft employee. I'm saying it's a fundamental, fundamental um, philosophical difference. Apple doesn't believe in compatibility. My kid's iPhone, he's got an iPhone 6, and he's stuck on iOS 12 until the end of time because they just decided. But you can run Windows 10 on incredibly old hardware. So 1.5 billion people run Windows, and we can't break that. But could we make another one, a parallel one? So we could run the old stuff, and it would continue to work, and we could run the new stuff. So what we went and did is we created a new console. Con PTY, uh, let's go to Google. Introducing the pseudo console, blah, 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 text, blah, blah, blah. Hey, that's what a terminal was. Look at that. <laughs> I mean, that's the whole deal, right? Like that, that is the good stuff right there. And actually, we'll... <laughs> that's actually the, that's the two guys that wrote Windows. I don't know what those guys are doing. That's, some, uh, that's Dennis Ritchie. Working on a PDP-11. Oh, Admiral Grace Hopper, yay! She invented the compiler. She did not, she did not suffer fools. Whatever was going on in this picture, she was not having it. <laughs> She's like, why are you even here? Okay, ooh, this is a nice, lovely picture. Look at that. That actually says the word. So, right, the, the, the original issue was that the terminal and the applications were stuck together. And now there's an intermediate thing there where you've got this thing called the PTY or the pseudo console. And basically, Windows did not have one, right? Which meant you could not have third-party consoles. All those third-party consoles I showed you were just hacks around it. So Windows 10 introduced a pseudo console back in the day. Welcome to the Windows pseudo console. Blah, 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 pictures, pictures, boxes and lines. Boxes and lines, boxes and lines. Look at that. Box, very colorful. It's lovely. Whoever did that probably did a good job. Okay, don't worry about any of this stuff. Here you go. There's a whole thing in here. Investing in yesterday, blah, blah, blah. And it basically walks through how these things work. You don't have to worry about that, kids. But what we did is we made a new terminal called the Windows Terminal. It's yummy, and you can get it for free in the Windows Store. You can just go to the Windows Store, type terminal. You can get it right now. The kids can get it. All the kids are jumping on the, uh, thank you for the Kleenex. Is that Kleenex? What is that? Is that a soda? What's happening here? <laughs> what kind of freaky looking Kleenex? You just had that in the car? Yeah, it fits in the cup holder. Ooh. <laughs> so soft. <laughs> My face is bleeding from these Qdoba things here. I'm like literally like pulling like three levels of skin off of my face from like, Rich was trying to kill me. This terminal has um, drop downs and icons. It's customizable, super cool. It's free, it's open source. You can build it yourself. You can go with control and scroll. Ooh, yeah, you can scroll to unusable sizes and also unusable sizes. It has no sense of decorum. There's no reason, there's absolutely no reason that I would ever want to do that. But we, there are no limits. I don't know why I did that. Okay. But this drop down is awesome because 
I can edit what's in it. I can go like this and say settings. And in fact, there is a JSON file. JSON, not a name, kids, but the JavaScript object notation. Okay. And um, let's see. I'm in CMD. I've got a couple of other ones. What do I got here? PowerShell Core. PowerShell Core. So this drop down here, that one is probably this thing, okay? Can we prove it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, cool. So that proves that that's, that is that thing. Cool, so then what are the okay hit false okay where are what are the uh, where are the kids what are the what are the dank memes the kids are talking about these days kids <laughs> what's on the snap what's on the ig come on what are we what is it baby yoda baby yoda dear baby yoda <laughs> baby yoda Oh, I'm so cute. I'm a baby. Uh, media, source, GIF, right click, save image, C colon temp, baby Yoda dot GIF. If you don't know who baby Yoda is, get to know baby Yoda, my friends, because it's totes adorbs. Uh, uh, uh. Background image. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so you might say, <laughs> Good night, everybody. It's over, baby. Um, so you might say, like, if you're if you're old and boring, and you don't have a Snapchat, uh, you might or a TikTok or whatever the kids are doing, right? I'm big on all those platforms, by the way. I'm huge, way bigger than you are. Um, you might be like, but why? But but the answer is what? Why not? Why not? Because it's freaking awesome, for no other reason that it's amazing. So then, what other stupid things could we do? with that, right? What if we did reaction GIFs for your build system? So you're going to go and write some software because you're writing that software, right? You're doing the software, you're doing your thing, and you go and you write, hey, I'm going to write the software. Fail, what? <laughs> and, then, and then you fix the program, and then you run it again, and you're like, what? <laughs> it worked. <laughs> so you can do anything. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. So this is, I made arcade attract mode. You know what attract mode is? Young people? He's actually on his phone right now. He's tweeting about it. He's not on. He, nobody's on Twitter these days. He's, he's Snapchatting. Come on. Um, attract mode. Do uh, you guys know what an arcade is? Right. Okay. You've been to an arcade, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course. Of course you have. Wonderland, right? Uh, once in a while. Once in a while. Okay. So you go to an arcade, and the arcade and the machine at the arcade is doing something when you're not looking. It's trying to attract you to come over. It's called attract mode. It's the background stuff. So I made an app that would put in random GIFs from Giphy at random intervals in order to get you to spend time inside of your terminal. which is awesome. So you can actually go and script it all in PowerShell because it's just a JSON file. Isn't that cool? So then in this case here, all you got to do is look at the output of the error level, right? And then if anything goes wrong with your last command, you can go and do that. That's sweet. Cool. Now each of these is individual. So all of these are different terminals and different prompts and different universes. We'll talk about that in a minute. 
They can have different fonts and all kinds of stuff. Now, next thing, who knows what a font ligature is? Okay, cool. Um, does anyone here write um, Arabic in like, uh, anyone write Arabic? You got Arabic? You write in Arabic? And have you ever done it in like, um, in Word? So Arabic is basically like a cursive language, but it includes ligatures where one character looks different when it is next to another character. So if you have like an Aleph and another character and they're separated by a space, they look like they stand on their own and then you put them next to each other and they're like, ooh, and I'll do a cursive thing between them. And being able to do that is called a font ligature. So fonts know whether or not the Aleph is at the beginning of the sentence, in the middle between two words, or at the end of a sentence. Okay, that's called a font ligature. Fonts have that stuff. In fact, given that it's the holidays, I'll give you a little pro tip. Holidays or any kind of family events, make sure that you put Hanselman in front of everything that you Google for. <laughs> and uh, I did making awesome wedding documents. Okay? Did you know, my friends, that you could go into Word... And you could go into here, and then you could pick a font like, I think it's called something with a C. Doo, 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 doo. It is called da, 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 da. Gabriola. You have Gabriola. Gabriola is not just any font, my friends. Gabriola. Okay, regular font, nothing fancy going on there. Okay, right click, font, advanced, use stylistic sets. Mm -hmm. Subtle, did you see it? One, two, one, or two, one, or two. Right click. Fonts, stylistic sets. That's the wrong one. Doo, doo, doo. I want to say seven. There it is. Yeah, baby. Holy crap. What's happening? All right. So the the ligatures depend on there's a D, there's a capital D, there's two D's next to each other, there's three D's in a row, right? Yeah. That's how you do a menu at your brother-in-law's wedding. Super cheap. <laughs> Not joking. People lose their minds. Okay? So a ligature takes two things like FI versus F and then the line and the I. It's super classy. We don't know why, but the, the lizard brain knows that it's classy. And you have to say when you say classy, you say classy. <laughs> super classy. Okay. Now, back to ligature. So why would you care at the DOS box? Well, hey, I'm going to learn how to program, right? Five is less than or equal to, you know, greater than or equal to two. There's no ligatures there. What? Yeah, it's weird. So, baby Yoda. So if you have, let me see if I can zoom in here. Baby Yoda's trying so hard. All right. Now you see how the cursor can go in between it? This is where things get interesting. And by interesting, I mean it depends on your personality about whether you think this is interesting. <laughs> Because there's kind of two, the, uh, the kids that are either here because you had no babysitter or because you're deeply interested in computer science. Um, I, I went and I taught this thing at, um, at Black Girls Code in Seattle and I had 15 15-year-olds 15 
and they were all told that a person from Microsoft was going to come and teach them how to code. So they were disappointed. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and I was going to teach them how to code, and they weren't going to care. And I said, my toaster is broken. And the best thing you can do to get a kid to talk is you say something like that, and you just pause and make it as awkward as possible. And the great thing about being a kid is that literally everything for you is awkward. And the great thing about being an old man is there's like literally nothing you can do to me to hurt my feelings. Like I, I am invincible. I can make it really awkward. So I just said my my uh, my toaster's broken, and I let it hang there for like five minutes. A little fourteen-year-old girl says, um, "Is it on?" I said, well, I turned it on. I pushed the toasty, you know, toasty button, and, and I paused, and I paused, and another little girl says, um, Does, is there power at, the, at the, the pluggy thing? And I said, I don't know. Well, how, should I, how should I tell if there's power at the pluggy thing? And she said, well, plug a light in and see if it turns on. And I said, I, I plugged a light in, and the light did not turn on. And I paused, and I paused, and then the other girl said, well, is there any power in the house at all? And you see what we're doing here? We're debugging the problem. The original conversation was about toast, and none of these kids thought it was cool to be a programmer, but by the end of it, the one that I knew was going to be the best programmer of them all, you know what she said? Do the neighbors have power? Oh. <laughs> That's a debugging question, you know what I'm saying? Like, she walked it all the way out to the street. You know, has, has, has there, is there a zombie apocalypse? Is there, you know, if you look into the city, is like all the lights out all over? You know, I just wanted to make toast. And she was concerned that like civilization, like, you know, the EMP had come and destroyed all electromagnetic uh, technologies. Anyway, I explained to them that that is all you need to be a programmer, right? So other people just want to have toast. And they will just basically go and say, well, I want to buy a new toaster, and I don't really care about any of those things. Of course, if the power is out in the neighborhood, they're not going to get any toast at all. At the same time, there's not a lot of uh, programmers on The Walking Dead, so you might think about your skill sets, <laughs> whether or not it's, you know, like, hey, the zombies are killing us all. What are we going to do? Do you need me to reboot the router? <laughs> You're dead. OK. So let's do this. What if we go out to the command line, baby Yoda? And we go out to DOS, but not DOS. And I'm going to say copy con abc.txt. You ever copy a file, copy from file to file? What's con? Console. Console. So we'll copy the file. Now we're in the middle of a file copy. See, I hit control Z, the end of the file, and it said one file copied. I literally just copied a file from here to there, except here was the console. Now we'll open it up in Notepad. That's what's in the file. So to be clear, there are two characters inside the file. Then I will say type ABC. And one thing is shown. So there's two bytes in the file, and it shows as one thing. But what if we go out to somewhere else? <coughs> Okay, that font has ligatures turned. That one has ligatures turned on. Uh, if we go back to PowerShell Core and we look at the settings, remember the settings? Uh, settings. We were in this one, right? Okay, you see what's going on there? What's going on there? What did I do on line 44? I changed the font to one that didn't have that ligature or that glyph. You know what NF stands for? No, nerd font. It literally stands for nerd font. You should have known that, nerd. Nerd fonts. Go and Google with Bing for nerd fonts. You can get all the fonts. So what it does is it takes the regular fonts that your machine comes with, A through Z, 1 through whatever, and then it adds other fonts from other places. These are all places fonts can come from. There's font awesome, oops, which includes awesome fonts. 
There's power line, we'll talk about in a minute, that includes seven icons. There's the ever crucial weather icons. The problem is, of course, when you make a custom font, when you basically, it's like a cafeteria plan where I want a little of this, and I'd like some weather symbols, and I'd like the power lines. The font gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and it could potentially slow things down. And you can get this one here that has 2,000 like other fonts. So like you think emoji are crazy. There's thousands of characters that you can go and get these things with. So the NF includes nerd fonts. Now, what other freakishly bad things could we do with ligatures? And why would you want it? Why, why is that useful? Why is that a thing? Why is that interesting? Program at APL. Mm, that's a little bit of an old school reference. <laughs> but the point is, is it makes people happy. It's stylistic. Very nicely done, sir. It is stylistic, as the young person just said. Wisdom from the mouths of babes. Um, because it is clearer, you can go like this. Hyphen, hyphen, uh, greater than. See? Two of them is a thing, three is not. Now, here's where uh, you're going to have to have an argument with the family and someone's going to sleep outside today. <laughs> he, he immediately starts, he's like, you've gone too far. I was with you with the less than equal sign, but the freaky W, th no, 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 no. Like, you know, dub, dub, dub. What is that? What is, I mean, look at that. Somebody thought that was a good idea. <laughs> that is a phenomenally bad idea. I'll go out and search for Hanselman ligatures. I made a whole blog post about this. Oh, that's another one. Here's a freaky one. That's called a bang. You call it an exclamation point, but programmers don't tolerate long words like that's a bang. That's equals. That's two equals. That's three, which kind of makes sense. That's actually kind of useful. If you had three equal signs in a row, that's not really helpful. But if you did that, that's pretty clear. But people don't realize that if you do that, it means like five is not equal to two, right? In the languages that matter. <laughs> I was in, so I'm in uh, Czech, 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 Czechia. It's not, no, no, Czechia. Did you know about this? Czechoslovakia changed their name. Yeah, the Czech Republic changed their name. And they changed it. This is a real thing. You can Google it. Uh, he's doing it right now because he doesn't believe me. They call it Czechia now, which sounds like Chechnya, different place. Totally different thing. But they thought it would cause more tourism. That is a mistake. Uh, Chechia is not Chechnya, is the former Czech Republic, is Czechoslovakia. Anyway, so I'm in that place. And this, uh, I gave a one hour talk on C sharp and how great C sharp was, and everyone should learn C sharp and it's wonderful. And I thought it was a great talk, and everyone like, gave me like golf applause at the end. And then uh, a, a fella says, Why should I learn C sharp? I'm like, I just did an hour. <laughs> Why don't, why don't I just learn Go, which is another language? And I didn't know what to say. I was kind of, but, I, and I, but I'm like, I'm in the depths. I'm in, the, I'm in Czechia. I'm in Prague. And I said, well, why should I learn Czech? And he's like, what are you talking about? I speak Czech. We all speak Czech. And I said, yeah, but it's not going to win. <laughs> I mean, why are we even bothering? I mean, seriously, you should just speak English. I mean, Czech's not going to win. I mean, it's a lovely language, but what are there, like 3 million of you? I said, we got 3 million in like Seattle. We could totally take you guys. <laughs> and he was like, oh, but it's my culture and it's my happy. And I said, oh, so you like your language and it makes you happy. Yeah, you should probably stick with it then, shouldn't you? Same thing. You use the language that makes you happy, and you don't shame somebody's, uh, anyone else's language, except, except PHP, which sucks. <laughs> but, but, but anybody else, anybody else, you've got you to respect their language. 
right? Yeah. Because there's two things that I can't tolerate, is the intolerant and the Dutch. <laughs> no, but, um, but yeah, I was trying to make the point to the guy that it's like, like pick the language that makes you happy. Okay, so that is literally stored on disk in that other way. Doing font ligatures in this way, to, to set that up in the terminal was really complicated, to make good looking fonts at scale and be able to make even also a transparent terminal and all of the things with the animated GIF it took a non-trivial amount of work. And the ability to do those ligatures, if you go and search for font ligatures, you can pick the lots of programmer fonts people like, makes them happy. Now, this prompt right here is saying I'm on the C drive, I'm in the users folder, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What is that? It's my blood sugar. Oh, yeah. Did you know that? Well, I heard you talk about it before. Yeah, that's my blood sugar. I'm diabetic. I have an implant. It's a battery in my stomach with a needle about that long, and it's sending my blood sugar out to the cloud and into my prompt. Yeah. It's crazy. It's not crazy at all. It's glanceable information. It's my, da my prompt is my dashboard, so I need to know that stuff. So if I'm staring at the thing all day, I'd like to know what my blood sugar is. And that's the trend line. That's kind of cool. What other stuff do we put in our prompts? Right? What's that? Yeah, that's my Git branch. That's exactly right. I'm in the main, in the main branch right there. That's cool. And um, I can think of, make sure that that's updated. It is updated. And if I were to make a change to something, like let's change readme. Right? So nothing added, one change, nothing removed. Ah! I don't know what that means, right? <laughs> Probably like, it doesn't mean not. It means uh, something's happening. What does that mean, anybody? I have no idea. It means bang. Yeah, that's so, <laughs> so helpful. <laughs> I remember one time uh, I was learning in math class in the, uh, the mid-80s, <clears throat> and um, we were learning factorials, and they were like, what is this? And I was like, five! <laughs> I had to go like straight to the the principal's office. I did not. That's what it says. Anyway, um, so then I can go get reset uh, hard head, and then I'm back at main. Okay, cool. So this is a lovely prompt here. This is a nice looking prompt. It's got your blood sugar. It's got your your git and whatnot. That's cool. But but wouldn't it be Yummier. Look like this. <clears throat> I can't do Baby Yoda, but I can do that. Right? So I can go mount C GitHub. So this is kind of a cool looking thing. What we've got here. How are we doing? Ah, too far. How are we doing that? That's a glyph. That's called a power line glyph. Remember, I said I went to nerd fonts and I got that. So you can get, you can set up your own PowerShell uh, prompt really easily. If you go up to the blog, Hanselman PowerShell prompt. How to make a pretty prompt in Windows with nerd fonts, which sounds like a, like a rap band, um, Cascadia Code, which is a new open source font from Microsoft that you can get. And when you install the Windows terminal, you get that font for free. It's very cool. WSL, which we haven't talked about yet in this content-free final presentation of the year. Um, and oh my posh. So PowerShell is a prompt in Windows, and some of us use PowerShell, and it's often called Posh. And Oh My Posh makes your PowerShell better. So it makes cool looking prompts like this. 
They can look super fun and you get total control of the theming and the look and the feel and everything. You can have emoji and animations and all kinds of fun stuff. And I walk you through step by step by step of how to do this. Isn't that cool? Mm. It's yummy. Now, when you are in the PowerShell, oh, Yoda, there are some things that you might want to do. So remember when I was saying CD this and CD that? That's kind of bad. Um, if I make a folder like uh, young people or the youth, the youth, I don't know how to spell youth. I go in there. I can say push D. I could go somewhere else. Like I could go to go to the GitHub folder, and I could say ah wrong button, go away. And I could say push D. And then I could go over to the main folder. I could go home. And then I could say pop D, pop D. Some of us have been programming for 20 or 30 years, and we'll go, yes, of course. That was in Fordos in 1984. And by some of us, I mean you and me, because we're super old. And for the rest of you, you're going to be like, how did I not know this? It's because we were keeping it a secret, because it makes us more productive. That pushes the directory onto the stack, and then you can pop off to the stack. And that was super useful when you make shell scripts and automation scripts and stuff like that, because you'd find yourself going cd dot 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 dot, and you'd be moving around, and you couldn't get your system back into a, a state that was understandable. So push D and pop D are super useful things to do. And I've talked a little bit about F7 before. You know, you can push F7 in DOS and you can get this cool ASCII looking deal. And young people are always like, ah, where's this coming from? Literally 25 years old. But you can lie and just tell them it's Windows 10. It's a new feature, <laughs> new feature of Windows 10. Okay? But I'm in PowerShell and I can go and say notepad dollar sign notepad dollar sign profile. I can see my profile. And this is my profile, which is super awesome. I think I feel pretty good about this one. A couple of things that I've done. I have made aliases for the three places I tend to go the most. So if I'm like chilling and I go and say downloads, it takes me there. Or if I say GitHub or if I say desktop, it gets me there. That's a nice thing. You should do that also, I would propose. But I also didn't do a thing called Z. Z is a PowerShell module that's a smarter CD. I can type Z, G, I, tab. Z, D, E, Z, oops. And these are the places I have been recently. Isn't that cool? And the more you go to those places, the more it builds a database of stuff. And then you just have to type Z and then a couple of characters, and it'll take you there way faster. Why should you know this? This is driving stick shift. <laughs> While the young people are Ubering, I'm double clutching from first right into third gear, skipping second gear entirely. <laughs> and you're still in the app trying to get the app to launch to get the Uber guy to show up. Scott, that, part of that is an excellent question. If I went out and I typed in Hanselman to search for something, and I find a blog post called Spend Less Time CD and Around with the PowerShell Z Shortcut. That is, in fact, that. Take a picture and do that. It's a PowerShell module, open source PowerShell module. And it's an alias for this whole function. And you say install module Z and import the module. And it works wonderfully and works with push D. And it stores everything in a text file called CD history. So the more you use it, the faster it gets, and the more awesomer you are, if awesomer was a word. OK. So I've got Z. I've got Oh My Posh, which is shiny. And then I've got PS Color, which gives you directory but color. It serves no other purpose that it's prettier. Isn't that nice? Then I can go Alt-Enter to go full screen. And then with the, new, um, you know, with the new terminal, I could also go Windows Tab. No one does this. Open a new desktop. OK. And then pick up the terminal 
stick it on the other desktop, alt enter to be full screen, and then four finger swipe from here to my to other desktop. Now Mac people have had that for years. And I've actually seen people buy Macs to be able to do the four finger swipe thing. They're like, oh, yeah, so you're nodding. You're like, oh, I love that part of my Mac, right? Wouldn't it be cool if that was in Windows? Well, it's been built into Windows for years and no one knows it. <laughs> it's totally true. It's been in there for years, but y'all don't do it. Uh, it is shift windows right arrow shift no control shift windows right arrow something like that So once you let me see once you have the terminal new desktop thingy da, da, da. Ka, uh, Move the file over here doo, doo, doo. So I'm here, how do I switch desktops? I can't remember. It's like control shift alt something and you stand on one head or something on your head or something. There's some way for it. But there's also an app that is called Peach. Called Peach Virtual Desktop that makes these things easier. And it gives you, there you go. It makes it this. I'm not sure who asked that, but Peach takes whatever the hot shot key that I can't figure out is and just gives you way better ones. And then in Windows now, you can actually go up here and name the desktops. See? Which is kind of cool, too. So Peach plus that's super cool. But that's not all. There is a thing called the Windows Power Toys. <laughs> all my old people are like, what? That was in 1995. <laughs> yes, it's back. It's back and it's better than ever. Let's go and run the Windows Power Toys. What could go wrong? <laughs> Installing things while driving the car. This is fine. Everything is going to be great. This is going to be here for about an hour. You ever do this thing where you just zoom in? And you just see if you can watch the pixel, like if it can just go past here, <laughs> then that means it's going to be okay. Oh, anti-malware service. I promise there's no malware. Oh, indexer. I promise I'm not going to search for this anytime soon. I just want to install it. I don't know what validating means. Does it need validation? You're okay. You're a good, you're a good installer. It's going to be fine. Go away, Windows Search. Go away, anti-malware. Just install the darn thing. <laughs> the part that's funny is it'll sit there for an hour and then it'll go, and then it's done. You know, and it's just like whatever. It will be worth it, my friends. While I'm doing that, did you know that you could go over here into the Windows um, Task Manager? And if you see a thing that is bothering you, like the Windows Search Index, you can now open it, right-click, and directly stop the service. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's super useful, and then it will immediately come back because it's not going to take no, no for an answer. <laughs> which, is, which is fine. Uh, it's more of a stop. No, fine. Go ahead. It's more of a come on. You ever, notice, you ever notice your computer acts like this only when people are looking? It's fine at home. Like it's doing its thing. If you would all just look away briefly. <laughs> Is it quantum mechanics that's causing that to happen? That'll be done in about an hour. So we'll come back to that. Okay. So I'm going to show you that in a second. Um, oh, so all of these settings can be added and, and set in any way that you want. And the thing that I was originally going to talk about uh, was I wait for Power Toys to come up in the next. This is ridiculously long. I don't know what's going on. We'll see. Um, was that um, WSL. Okay, cool. So I'm going to turn off Baby Yoda because he's stressing me out. <laughs> Just a smidge. What's going on up there? Can't tell what's in my head and what's not. 
How can I let them know I've got no inner monologue? Uh, oh, oh, oh. Okay, so this is, how's, how do I explain this to y'all? Okay, I think I'm going to have to not explain this to the young people because it's comp. Oh, is it done? Okay, I think it's done. Power Toys. All right, check this out. So install Power Toys, and we're going to be, basically we're using Power Toys as an excuse to do cool stuff without asking for permission at Microsoft. Um, and uh, launch Power Toys. Cool. All right, did it launch? Did you run? Power Toys. Why are you doing this? Oh, the app and then I see. There we go. One second. It'll be worth it. All right, cool. Power Toys is a collection, a loosely confederated collection of other apps. Fancy Zone, Shortcut Guide, and Power Rename are the first ones, and we're going to basically add a bunch of stuff to make Windows better. So the first things that we've added is this. If you hold down the Windows key, you know the Windows key that does all these great things? We will give you a shortcut guide of all the different shortcuts, because you know like Windows E and Windows D, Windows this and that. Check out the icons at the bottom here. Did you know that those icons are in fact hotkeys by themselves? Windows 1, Windows 2, Windows 3, right? You knew that? You didn't know that, did you? Some of you knew that. Yeah, it's useful. So like, look, you see how, let's do this. I'm going to pick up Notepad. I'm going to drag it over here, okay? It's now Windows 2, so Windows 2. So I'm going to close all my Notepads. We'll go and run one of them. I'm going to right click and I'm going to pin it to the taskbar and I'm going to drag it over here and then I'm going to close it. So now it is Windows 2. Shiny, shiny. Now I'm going to hold down Shift while clicking on it. Each time you click on it, because I held Shift down, it opens a new one. Right click, close all windows versus clicking on it and then it just goes like that. It's the same one. I can middle mouse click and that will also be shift. But not everyone has a middle mouse, especially if you have a touchpad. Mm -hmm. And if I go shift control click, it will run it as administrator. Mm -hmm. You want to go? You want to go? Let's go. <laughs> okay, so that's cool. Now, if I hold down shift and I click a bunch of them, now I hit Windows 2, and it's alt-tabbing through just those ones. Mm. So each time I hit Windows 2, it goes through a different one, which is shiny. Cool. Nobody does this stuff. Why is this important, kids? This is why. Because one day, you're going to go and have some text. I don't have any text, so I'm going to get some lorem ipsum generator to make some text. How can I get some? I want five paragraphs. You ever make lorem ipsum text? And I'll put that there. Actually, you can even do uh, Samuel Jackson lorem ipsum. <laughs> Slipsum. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, It's got to be one that's clean. Now I feel really bad. I apologize. Anyway, you get the idea. We won't do that one. But there's a whole list of them, of all of the things. There's Hodor, Ipsum. Make placeholder text great again. All right, 
So I'm going to go back over here. <laughs> and um, what was I doing? There was a reason for this. <laughs> Why did I need some text? I, I knew, what was I doing? It's going like that. And I was going Windows 2. Cycling through Windows 2. There's a reason I needed text, though. Gosh darn it. One day you'll need to. Oh, the young people. One day, young people, you will need to copy some text. And the difference between uh, someone who makes a lot of money at work and someone who doesn't is this. I'm going to copy this text, right? And you're going to go like this. And I want to point out that the hotkeys are right there. <laughs> You're literally, they're literally there. Now, here's the thing, though. What is your brain doing from this point to up here and doing this? Are you thinking? You're not. You, 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 you can say, I want to copy paste this text over here, like you, that you're thinking that. The trick is, how do you make the distance between the thought and the I.O., the input output, as fast as possible. Control C, Control V, right? You have, that's what you're trying to do. Things like double click, triple click, Control X, those are things like a couple of hotkeys. You don't need to remember 50 of them. You just remember like five or 10. And it's the difference between like shooting a bullet and throwing it. <laughs> it's a whole other completely different thing. Know your freaking hotkeys. Even me, even me moving all these windows around is stupid. What if I could go like windows left and right? Right? And then I could go windows two and then windows left and right. Right? And then move around and basically snap these guys where they need to snap. That'd be cool because you can do that now. Like that's a thing. And it's been a thing for like 10 years, but no one does it. Everyone talks about it. Everyone's like, oh, you know how to do that? No, you don't. You never do that. You're a liar. <laughs> eh, Windows left and right was added in Windows 7. Oh, tiling is Windows. Yes, but fancy zones is all new, kids. Look at this. You can make your own templates. Mm. Holy <laughs> crap. Now I'm going to make some notepads. Boop, boop, boop. Okay. And I'm going to hold down shift while I'm dragging them. What? Huh? Maximize into one. What's that? Maximize a window into one of those columns. Maximize a window into a column. Oh, if you maximize it, it will go full screen. You don't like that? If only it were open source and you could volunteer to help. <laughs> so I want to point out, to your point, override hotkeys at the top to snap between zones. So the hotkeys that I was showing can snap around them. You can also keep them in their zones when the resolution changes. So you can come up with these things. Additionally, if you change zones, you can decide. So I think that the options are there to get you what you want. But um, you don't get to complain. <laughs> What's cool about it, though, is you can pick your own and you can go and design them in any way that you want because you can make a zone configuration. So if you're doing stuff at work, right, here's one, and you're going to have like your editor here and the browser there and something else over here, that's pretty cool. All right, you like that? We friends still? Good. All right, cool. So that's Power Toys and that's Yummy. Um, let's talk about WSL and why that's significant. Okay. At the very, very beginning, I asked you all if you knew what WSL was, and some of you did, and some of you did not. Um, this is DOS, but not really DOS. And this is PowerShell. And this is Ubuntu. This is literally full Linux on Windows. It is a, we are shipping a Linux kernel with Windows 10. There are two versions of WSL, the Windows subsystem for Linux. 
And uh, you can go out to the command line and type WSL dash dash list dash V. And you can see that I have two Linuxes running. One's version 1, one's version 2. And I've got one that I haven't run yet that is currently stopped. And then the one with the star by it is the currently default one. So when I type bash 1, 1000, that is Ubuntu. Not fake Ubuntu, not a big giant virtual machine that took 30 you know, gigs of space and not virtual machine or virtual box or any of that. It's just boom, it's Ubuntu. So if I close the Windows terminal, open it back up again, double click, 1, 1,000. It's that fast. It's a 50 meg utility virtual machine, and it's super shiny and, and wonderful. And your C drive is at mount, oops, C. So that is the Windows C drive. And this is the <coughs> Ubuntu world. OK? Now, lots of us have used virtual machines before, and we've played with virtual machines. But a virtual machine is like a box inside your box. It's a computer inside your computer. And it feels like that. It feels like it's a hassle like to go out, oh, time to start the virtual machine. And it takes all this time, and you run it in a square, and you run like your Hyper-V or your virtual box or your parallels or whatever. And it's a thing. Right? It's like, ugh. But what if I could go in here and find a, some, something like here's, a, um, here's an app. So I'm in, I'm in Ubuntu, and I'm sitting in the home Scott Vegas Linux folder. And I could type, uh, let me see, there's program.cs, and I could type notepad.exe and run it. So what just happened there, and why is it significant? I am in Linux, a real Linux, virtualized Linux, and I just ran a Windows executable. Because we own the kernel because it's open source and we can fork it and we put everything upstream. We can catch things like that. We can catch someone trying to run a Windows executable. So even better, what if I could say explorer.exe? a Windows path on top of a Linux path. That means that there is a mapping between what is a Windows path and what is a Linux path. And there are a set of WSL utilities. And there's a thing that I believe is called, I want to say WSL path, where I could go and say WSL path C users, and it will come back with mount C users. See? So I gave it that. And it gave me the equivalent. So I could write a script and translate from one to the other and back. But nothing's on top of it. I mean, there is a, it is a separate universe, but it is easily moved between. There's an artificial network uh, provider called a Plan 9 server that makes it look like those, those are machines on the network, but it's all local. So I can access these files. Does that make sense? That's significant. That's really, really significant. Because you don't want to just say, hey, look, it's Linux virtual machine. You want it to mean that, popping all the way off the stack to the beginning of the conversation, any shell, anytime, anywhere. So as a Windows user, if you are a Windows user in the, in the room here, there has been a time in your life where you were out on the internet Googling on how to do something. And you were Googling around. And one day, it was like, how to do a thing. And then you got to a website and it says, first, uh, go to the prompt, and you saw the dollar sign, and you're like, I guess this is not for me, <laughs> right? Right? My prompt looks like this, and you want me to be here, and now you feel excluded, right? How to install Postgres, how to install, you know, Node, how to do this in Docker. You can do all of those things. Now, Mac users, there's probably some Mac users here, uh, fool themselves, no disrespect, into thinking that Mac runs Linux. And it doesn't. It runs Darwin, which is a BSD-ish Linux enough. And then they dev on the thing, and they use things like Homebrew 
to install things on a Mac, fooling themselves into thinking that that's the same as Snap or apt-get or other things. So there's still an impedance mismatch between reality and uh, production. And on a Windows machine, now you can do all of these things. A $300 machine from Walmart can run full Linux. You can go into the store and go and search for Linux. If this has a problem, it'll be because I'm running a preview of the store. Uh, and I say, go results for Linux. Get the apps. This is all, I mean, most 99% of these are free. One of them costs five bucks. Ubuntu, OpenSUSE, Debian, Alpine, whatever. And then download it. And all it is, is it's a tarball, a zip file, of the Linux that you want to run. And it's the full thing. Now here's where things get interesting. I think I've got some node here somewhere. One of these is nodish. Uh, where am I? I think I put a node file here. How do you search for stuff on Linux? How do I search for anything that's .js below where I'm at right now? Like that? That's so helpful, thank you. <laughs> so nice. Ugh, it's such a trash. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's not in any way what I wanted to do. <laughs> Find dot I name, that's intuitive. Hyphen I name, that's even more intuitive. And then that. All right. Yeah, it's so much better. I haven't done Linux in 25. Yeah, exactly. I haven't done Linux in 25 years. I used to teach this crap at PCC, but it's still, uh, that's not intuitive. I don't care what planet you're from. But thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. So here's a server.js. There's some node, and it's going to go and open up a port and listen on 8000 and return hello world. Okay, so I say node, and it says server running on 8000. And then I can go over here, and I can say localhost 8000, and it works. How is that possible? What does localhost mean? It means this computer. But there's n number of computers on this machine, right? So what we're doing is we're lying to you. If you know about how virtualization works, we saw that you opened up port 8000 on localhost local to Ubuntu, and then we port mapped it and punched a hole. So localhost on the Windows machine is different. In fact, if I said 127.0.0.1, it would not work. The localhost is magic and is being going is going back into the Ubuntu machine because technically there's this tiny utility virtual machine inside that's making that possible but that's still pretty cool because that's what you would expect to happen so you don't have to worry about the internal details that it did what you thought it ought to have done All right now here's where it gets crazy what if i said i want to run visual studio code inside of WSL. Downloading Visual Studio Code server. What's that? <laughs> Visual Studio starts up. Pause for effect. <laughs> Splits in half. Half of Visual Studio runs in Linux, half runs in Windows. Which half runs where? What are the responsibilities? How do you split the responsibilities up? What? UIs. The UI runs on Windows, and everything else runs in Linux. Now, syntax highlighting, that's a language service. IntelliSense, 
that's a language service. Console dot, that's a moment. Who can provide that? Make sense? Here's an idea. Let's see if this works. This might not work. I haven't tested this in a while. If I go to GitHub, uh, here we go, Go. Remember we talked about Go before? Here's the same thing in Go. Go is a, is a language. I do not have Go on my computer. I'm going to say code dot. You can see it's not running in WSL. And it says, hey, this folder has a development container config file. Would you like to reopen this as a container? I'm just going to reopen it. Now it is talking to Docker, downloading an instance of Linux, installing Visual Studio code into the thing, opening the Go file, syntax highlighting it, and when I hit dot, it works. I can run Go now. Make sense? Excuse the sniffles again. Listening on port, listening on port 9000. So now I am debugging Go on localhost in Visual Studio Code on a machine that doesn't have Go on it. How is that possible? Remember it said, hey, this is a development container? Well, there's nothing fancy. It's just a folder. There's nothing interesting going on here. There's a file, there's a readme, there's some stuff, and then there's a folder called .dev container. And in that JSON file, it says, hey, we need an extension, line 6, called go. And... That's interesting. If you've ever used Visual Studio Code, check out the left-hand side here. There's the local extensions and the ones that exist only in the container. So every extension can be optionally installed. So in this case, we have some that are running in Windows, the ones that I want running all the time. And in this case here, Go language support runs only in this one container. So when I'm running it ordinarily, I don't have Go. And in this case, I do just when I have this one container open. And then there's a Docker file. And here's the Docker file. And the first time it runs, it installs Go in the container. So why is this interesting? Think about when you go to work at a new company for the first time. You get a job from one of our wonderful sponsors. And they say, hey, welcome to the company. Get your machine set up. And then six months later, right, you start working on the thing. Now, old Linux heads will say, oh, well, we'll make you an environment in the cloud, and you can connect to that remotely. But then you end up just in a terminal running Vim or, God help me, Emacs or something, and, and then your i7, your high-quality supercomputer, is doing nothing. This is back to good old client-server work where some things happen locally and some things don't, and we split up Visual Studio Code. So I'm running Go. I could run Rust. I could run any number of applications instantly. OK? Where time's up. No. Last thing I'll show you. Yeah, I got to go. My kids are going to be asleep soon. Is if you could do this, how far could you take it? What if we could do this? Mm -hmm. Someone knows where I'm going with this. Sign in. You can do all this today. I'm not showing you anything that you couldn't do like yesterday. Um, that's probably not where I want to be. Did it get started? Where am I supposed to go? Environments. Here we go. Look at this. So I've got a Linux machine with 8 gigs of RAM. 
four cores running up in the cloud. Let's go and open it in Visual Studio Code. Probably we'll start it up or something. There you go, starting. So now you can imagine you would make a development environment in the cloud that wouldn't be something you'd SSH into and run Emacs on. It would be a machine to make your Chromebook or your $300 Walmart machine God's own computer. And you only pay for it by the minute. It's not like Netflix and you gotta pay for the whole month, right? Then we hit on, we hit open. Look at the lower left corner. Okay. Starting up remote connection. And I'm going to be running in Azure a version of .NET that I don't have locally. There you go. Say, look, now it's downloading all the things that it needs for that Linux machine. Be done in just a second. It's way faster than it is on my local machine because it's a full on single task machine. Then I can go and forward URLs and that local host trick that we can do, same thing. So could we hit F5? I don't know. It's been a while since I've done this. So we're going to hit F5 and debug this. I've had a couple of challenges with this because of port. Like, see, it's warning me about SSL. But look, that port is being forwarded up into Azure. Isn't that crazy? So think about how much easier onboarding would be and making everyone's computer the same quality how you can just connect to an environment and everyone could do that. The last thing I want you to go and take a look at, and I don't suppose anyone has a laptop open. I see you're working, but you could theoretically, I could go and say start live share and I could give you a URL, right? It's a long, crazy URL. And then that would install an, as an extension and any one of you that has Visual Studio Live open would be able to connect to that. Now, not pushing pixels, you would connect to that Visual Studio and be able to have your own cursor and select the text. It would be your fonts, your style, your colors, everything the way that you want it. So instead of using like Skype or Zoom it or something to do pair programming, imagine as a, as a teacher, if we were doing a workshop, I could have all hundred of you go into the same thing and you could run around and look at the files. You wouldn't have to even look at the file I was looking at. You'd have full access and we could do a collaborative hundred person debug session. Isn't that crazy? All of this exists today. Nothing I've shown you is future stuff. Okay. Did a whole Amanda Silver is the PM that owns Visual Studio, and her team invented this. She's amazing. You should check out uh, her stuff. And, oh, hey, look, it's me. Let me see if I can fast forward to some demo here. Here you go. So on the right-hand side is Visual Studio Code, and the left-hand side is Visual Studio Proper. You can see on the right-hand side it says Jonathan Carter. The person on the left is moving their mouse and clicking around, and it's affecting the other cursor, the secondary cursor on the right. It's super fast, and you can even do it over phone tethering. Because sometimes I'll find myself at Starbucks, and I'm like, hey, can you take a look at this code? And then you end up like instinctively or intuitively just opening up Skype or whatever. And it's like, I'm going to go and push 4K pixels so I can see text. They can actually set breakpoints, run, um, run refactoring. And they can do it in their environment rather than in, um, in yours. It's super cool. And it's all free, and it already exists today. In fact, all of this stuff already exists. And if you go into Visual Studio that you have now, this is Visual Studio. It's been sitting there all the while. Try it out. OK? So I think that's probably a good time to stop. So there's a lot of cool stuff happening in development right now. You should check it out. Oh, and, and 
Yes. Advertising. No, no, don't, don't applaud. I don't want your pity. <laughs> Listen to my podcast. What? Yes, I have, have a pod podcast? I have a podcast. Oh my lord. <laughs> As you know, being all native Portlanders, because we don't allow any Californians into this building. <laughs> with your fancy California money and your equity in your house. Um, Intel. Yeah, Intel. I know. Uh, uh, well, as you know, in, in, in Portland, NPR is piped directly into the womb. <laughs> and uh, I don't even know if there's another channel. There's only NPR. Um, and uh, this is trying to be the poor man's NPR. Uh, I've done 713 episodes. That is 353, 350 plus hours of content going back 15 years. Yeah, half an hour, 29 minutes to 35 minutes. And what's worth pointing out is that you'll notice that it looks like the mall. Because that is the goal. Tech is supposed to look like the mall. It's not just only supposed to look like me. And I have had, my wife's on there, I have, my wife's on there a couple times. Actually, you might be interested in the in the wife shows. I've done a couple of shows with my wife. Um, we've got uh, geek relationship tips. So if you want to learn about how normals and geeks get along, she, is, she, is, she has been a guest on a couple of times. And geeks, you should care about that. You it's should care about that. But anyway, it's a, it's, I'm, a, I'm actually, uh, the first 500 shows are trash, but the last 200 have been getting their feet underneath them. They're pretty good. So please do check out my show. Uh, they're all, and they're good for kids in the car. Uh, you know, if you're interested in quantum mechanics and stuff, like a little light, light conversation. Yeah. So yeah, check it out, please. Listen to my show and tell, tell your friends. I'm done. You want the uh, you want the, the the HDMI thing? No. No. Okay. I'm I need. Can I, can I unplug it? I am done with technology. Can I unplug it? Yeah. It's your computer. I just don't want his uh, streaming deal. And so, then Demola, I've got your power adapter. He's got the uh, he's got the microphone, but I got the voice. Oh, here. Take <laughs> that one. And you want this one? that one's Aaron, you want this? attached here.